I'm a state senator from the 32nd Legislative District, and I'm talking today from the Presbyterian Church in downtown Seattle at a wonderful conference talking about seeds and the international implications of seeds and for our future. It's been just a great, great presentation here today. What I tried to do was frame it so people understand that this is an international, a national, a state, and a local issue, and that when, when we look at at how we approach our food supply, uh, how we regulate it, why we even do this work, it really comes down, in my opinion, to two major issues. One is uh, food security, and I thought it was particularly appropriate that we're meeting in a church today because in the basement of this church is an emergency feeding program for people who do not have enough food. And yet we know we have enough food in this society. We have a maldistributive system. You know, our, our, our system of distribution is not working. So some people have food security and some people do not know where their next meal is coming from. And they, re, they a lot of them go to the churches for food, uh, you know, food packs, hot meals and the like. The other issue I raised is I think that we have a question of food sovereignty. You know, who controls the food supply? Do the people who grow the food, the farmers, the, the urban gardeners, um, you know, where there's a great move for urban agriculture at the present time, but you take a look at the availability of seeds, and if you control the seeds, the supply of seeds, then you essentially control the food supply. That's, that's sovereignty over the food supply, and that troubles me a great deal. Some of the other things that I, I remarked on is the, the widespread um, uh, participation of all sectors of, of our, our community. Uh, we have people from the universities, we have people from most of the occupations you might see. Um, I was surprised it was not all students. We've got, we've got a sizable number of young people here, but we have people from all ages. So it's, it's been a great conference so far. They're going extremely well extremely well. Let me just say that I understand that Monsanto has more money than we do and they're going to spend it liberally but we know that 72 percent of the people in this state believe that they have the right to know what's in the food they're buying and they also have a right they believe to know whether or not genetically engineered ingredients are in their food. And it's, so people are, are also adamant that they do not want the government or the corporations telling them what they can eat and what they can't eat or what they can buy or not buy. It is a right of people in, in this, this state, uh, according to 72%, and we think it's probably hitting, getting up closer now to 75%. Um, People believe that their fundamental rights as citizens are being tampered with and are in jeopardy. And so you mess with an American's rights, things that they believe they have a right, a fundamental right of citizenship, uh, you know, you, you're messing with the wrong, wrong group of people. So the campaign's going very well. I just got back from a trip. I'm in, uh, with a group called Penwar, Northwest Pacific Economic Region, and I was in Anchorage, and I went over to take a look at Pebble, at the Pebble Mine, the proposed Pebble Mine in Bristol Bay. Now, Bristol Bay is the, the site of the largest wild salmon spawning grounds in the world. It's where the action is for the, for the fish to spawn. It also has more Washington State fishing uh, families and processors uh, uh, who get their salmon from the Bristol Bay Run than any other state. I was really quite surprised to find that out. So this is an issue that is very near and dear to, to people in Washington State. We like our wild salmon. And people are concerned 
and I must say I think there's some legitimacy to this, uh, that the, the advent of genetically engineered salmon, Aqua Bounty has, has produced a genetically engineered a chemical, they can't call it a fish, they call it a chemical, um, and it has eels that cross the species line. These are combinations of DNA that simply cannot take place in nature. I tell my grandson it's all about sex. You know, you can't have sex outside your species or it's not normal, it's not natural. And so the genetically engineered salmon has some ocean eel in it, it has some other, other species of fish in it, and it grows um, uh, much faster. It has a life, life cycle of maybe 10 months, 12 months, where an, a wild salmon has more like oh, four years, five years. Uh, the quality of the, the, the flesh is, is, doesn't have the omega-3 levels. And, and, you know, quite frankly, it has never truly been tested. The, it's, they, there were tests done uh, on whether or not there would be allergens in this, uh, but they only tested with six fish. You know, any, even to get something that is statistically relevant, you would have to have at least 30 fish, you know, to make it any kind, have any kind of, of uh, substantive uh, information. And so you look at that and you say, well, the Food and Drug Administration is taking care of us. But you know, the Food and Drug Administration has a legitimacy crisis. They do not test the food. They, they sent letters, and we've got copies of the letters. They've sent, they've sent letters out to Monsanto and other genetically engineering firms to say, you are, we can find, uh, based on the, the, the information you submitted to us, we think that you're, you, uh, there's nothing damaging here. Remember, you're responsible for letting us know if there's anything damaging in any of these products. Well, for crying out loud, you know, we need independent, peer-reviewed science. We need some independent scientists to take a look at some of this stuff. There are very few independent scientists left in the world who are willing to work on GMO issues and our genetic engineering issues. Those that do have found some grievous kinds of problems, you know, tumors and the like. Well, I, I want that. I want that. That those studies peer reviewed. I want to find out if GMO foods are producing abnormalities. The thing that bothers me, you know, we know since 1996, when GMOs first entered the food chain, that we have um, right now we have between one and 88 or one and 60 births in the United States. Are, are the babies are being born on the autism spectrum. There, they, there's some, some form of autism. We didn't have that before that time. I don't know that you can say with any certainty, scientific certainty, because we don't have any studies, is this related to some of this GMO food we're feeding our families? And we don't even know it. I want labels. I, you know, our family would not eat that stuff if we knew. And I think that most of the citizens in the state of Washington agree with me. And so that's the kind of thing that we're learning at this conference. I think it's just it's a fabulous conference. Hey, Tom Altair here, certified nutritionist. I have two science degrees from Bastyr University. I work with the Autism Research Institute. And I'm really concerned as a father of five about the health and wellness of the children of today and tomorrow. So I'm looking into food, I'm looking into chemicals, and I'm here at a Biosafety Alliance conference in Seattle so we can talk to people about the probable health effects of the consumption of genetically modified foods. So a lot of people are interested in what may be happening to the human population with the consumption of GMOs, and the reality is no one knows. Although the average United States citizen is consuming about 198 pounds of genetically modified foods per year, we don't know what we're consuming because it's not labeled, and we have no idea what the adverse health consequences may be. The FDA in 1992, under the supervision of uh, Michael Taylor, who was a Monsanto employee, passed, without really much regulation, the allowance of genetically modified food into our food supply. And there are a number of geneticists, scientists, who are saying, no, wait a second. These are not the same as regular hybrid plants. Why in the world aren't we doing safety testing? Well, there's a lot of people saying they are the same, they're similar enough that you shouldn't be concerned. However, the term genetic modification implies that these are indeed new to nature. In fact, they are patented. 
if they were not different than natural compounds, there would be no need for patents. So if they are different, which they are, and you're inserting genes into a portion of an organism that you have no idea where the insertion is taking place, you're just hoping it does take place, you have no idea what the surrounding genome might be, you have no idea what happens when you do cloning, there is likely numerous variants in the DNA itself. We know of, in the research all the time now, something called a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is one nucleotide, one little base pair in the DNA that's changed. And we know that that can increase disease risk. So what happens when there's hundreds, if possibly thousands of changes, when you insert genes into an organism? We have no idea. So there's a, a big call amongst the scientific community to say, we need further testing. In fact, in the European Union, what we're finding now is they've said, look, Seralini's data, the study showing the rats who were fed GM corn, Roundup, or Roundup and GM corn, that had tremendous tumor growth and abnormalities of the pituitary gland, the kidney, the liver, they're now saying, look, this research is valid. We need to be concerned about this. So I'll tell you, the next step is for us as a group to stand up and say, wait a second, I don't want my children consuming this until you can guarantee me there are not going to be adverse health effects to my children and to the environment in which my children are growing up in. Because what we're seeing now is that the genetic modified pollen is getting on to the milkweed, which then can change butterfly migration and all sorts of factors. So we have no idea. With the now suggested introduction of RNA silencing apples or with genetic modified salmon, we're just adding more insult to injury. The original genetically modified crops have not been proven safe. There are no human safety data studies. There are no long-term studies at all in humans. There are no short-term studies in humans. This seems a little absurd to try and introduce now species. There's a rainbow trout they're working on. There's a salmon they're working on. We really need to stop, pause, and say, wait, let's make sure these are safe, and then we can consider continuing on if we do it all. So as a clinician, what we're looking at these days is a tremendous increase in irritable bowel. We're looking at a tremendous increase in neurological and behavioral disorders. So ADD, ADHD, autism. Interesting thing, Swanson wrote a paper in the Seattle Examiner that did a correlation between the introduction of an herbicide that's commonly used on genetically modified crops called glyphosate and the increase in autism. And she found almost a perfect correlation, uh, 0.985. So the correlation coefficient was 0.985. The tightest you can get is a 1, 1 1.0. So we're very, very close to that. Is it possible by us increasing the use of glyphosate, this herbicide Roundup, over the last decade plus, that we might be leaving our kids more susceptible for neurological diseases? Because it turns out that this glyphosate is a very potent mineral chelator. It binds to minerals and does not let them go. By binding those minerals, those minerals are not available to plants. Plants need those minerals in order to survive. They use them in their own biochemistry to produce things like aromatic amino acids, things you've heard of maybe tryptophan, you know, tryptophan, that amino acid that everybody takes if they have mood problems. The amino acid they take if they have sleep problems. Because tryptophan turns into serotonin in the body, and serotonin turns into melatonin. Serotonin is that feel-good neurotransmitter. Melatonin is the sleep neurotransmitter. It regulates your sleep-wake cycles. So is it possible that we've had a 400% increase in the use of antidepressant medication, yes. Since the increased use of glyphosate and the introduction of genetically modified crops, it's true, it has happened. Is it possible that we're seeing more aggressive behavior, that we're seeing more behavioral disorders, autism, because of the amino acid insufficiencies? We don't know, no one's looking at the data. Although Anthony Samsell and Stephanie Seneff in an article in Entropy did examine some of the existing research and said this is a plausible explanation for some of the increase. Perhaps that's why Swanson sees such a tight 
correlation coefficient between the increased use of this Roundup and the incidence of autism. So as a faculty member of the Autism Research Institute, one of the things we're constantly seeing that makes the biggest effect in these children's lives is to clean up their diets. It doesn't have to be a gluten-free, casein-free diet, although that helps. It doesn't have to be GAPS diet, although that may help. What is the most important thing is to clean up the diet. And what does that mean? As a consensus of nutritionists who are working in the autism, ADD, ADHD community, that means putting kids on organic diets, getting rid of the processed foods, lowering their exposures to some of the chemicals. In order to do this, my wife and I put out actually a cookbook called the Whole Life Nutrition Cookbook, and we have a website, a blog called Whole Life Nutrition. And in Whole Life Nutrition, we try and point out the fact that usually kids are imbalanced, adults are imbalanced, we're as a, a population imbalanced, when we have either too much of something or too little of something. We're either getting exposed to too many chemicals and toxins or food sensitivities, or we're not getting enough nutrients in. So we focus on consuming organic whole foods that are very nutrient dense and removing the processed foods. And at the same time, making it taste absolutely delicious. So if you want something that will help with lots of health ailments, whether it's the irritable bowel, attention deficit, autism, whatnot, consider eating a very nutrient-dense whole foods diet. So the question becomes, should we be voting on these initiatives, like Initiative 522 that's coming up here in Washington? It would label genetically modified foods. And by labeling genetically modified foods, then you could make a choice as to whether or not you want to contribute to a science that's very infantile, that's very not proven safe, and you could then vote with your money, because that's how change is going to happen, folks. It's not going to happen at the ballot box. It's going to happen at the grocery store. It's going to happen on a daily basis. When you go in and you look at an item and you say, aha, genetically modified, well, that means I'm going to promote the use of billions of pounds of chemicals that may be affecting bees, that is affecting soil, that's affecting water, that may be affecting humans, and we definitely know adversely affects animals. So yeah. Why wouldn't you vote? Why wouldn't you label that product so you can do your own experiment, remove those from your life, and see if your eczema, your irritable bowel, your mood changes get better? Because that's what I'm seeing in clinical practice, and I'm hoping you find something similar as well. Oh, hi, I'm Karen Chase with the Yes on 522 campaign, and I'm thrilled to be joining you from Chimicum, which is next to Port Townsend over on the peninsula. I was over here talking to some wonderful regional leaders about Yes on 522 and their upcoming film series, and I just love being over here. I am thrilled, actually, too, to be joining the campaign as a grassroots organizer. My official title is Karen Chase, Director of Constituencies, and you can reach me at karen at yeson522.com. Right now, what I'm doing is running all over the state talking to regional leaders on how we can implement our voter contact plan and talk to voters about truth in, and transparency, which is our right to have information about the foods we eat and we purchase for our families. It's about labeling, pure and simple. It's going to take every single one of us to win this. We know that the No campaign has five, five donors, and they've donated over almost three and a half million dollars, and they're all from out of state, by the way. Whereas we are a true grassroots campaign, we have over 5,000 donors in Washington State that have donated small donations, you know, like what the people can donate under 25 dollars, that kind of thing. Of course, we've got our wonderful supporters like Dr. Bonners and PCC and those guys, but we are majority of small donations, and we have also raised three and a half million. However, we are going to be outspent at least, at least um, five to one, we're thinking. So every little bit counts. What's going to win this for us is direct conversations between you and your neighbors. There's lots of support in this campaign because it's going to be up to us to get out the vote so we can label genetically engineered foods.
So you know what? We're ahead of the polls right now. It's like we know that the majority of Washingtonians really want to have information about their food so they can make their own informed decisions. But once the misinformation from those the no campaign starts putting TV ads out, it's going to be real important that we're ha keeping conversations open and talking about 522 is, a, is about having a right to know what's in our food so that we can make our own informed decisions. There are so many people connected to this campaign. It's your neighbors. It's local groups. It's all of us working together on this. What's really exciting is that my mom, Senator Marilyn Chase, is um, a co-chair of the campaign. So I'm, I'm really proud of her and excited about that. Also, Representative Carrie Condotta, a Republican, is a co-chair, as well as Trudy Bialik with PCC. It's incredible to work with such a broad, diverse coalition of people. But what's also fascinating are the, the numbers of farmers, fishers, the chefs, the co-ops, um, the moms that are all involved in this. So, so it's as though we're a giant Washington state coalition that really do want to make their own decisions on food. Okay, my name is Kate Bell. I'm from Washington, D.C., and I just got to Seattle, Washington, cross country with the Fishy Food Tour. We drove uh, the lovely art cars you see behind me all the way across the country to Seattle, Washington to promote awareness of genetically modified food and to support the ballot initiative in Washington State for a mandatory labeling of that food. So my friend Rika is one of the organizers of the Fishy Tour and she's been educating me on this issue for a while now. Uh, it's fairly new to me. I initially thought, okay, GMOs, science, we're going to improve our food supply. That all sounds good, right? And then I started doing my own research and I realized that when you actually buy genetically modified seeds from Monsanto, they make you sign a contract that you're not going to do scientific research with them. So essentially what we have is a system where the company that's profiting from this product is blocking scientific research into whether or not it's safe. And instead they're selling it to Americans and using us as a science experiment. Um, it's a little bit like having the tobacco companies in control of all the research determining whether tobacco is good for you, which obviously would not have been a good idea. Um, and what we're doing right now is we're trying to raise awareness and get these products labeled so that you as a consumer can make an informed choice about whether or not you want to eat GMOs. The tour was a lot of fun. We started on the 5th with our kickoff event in D.C., August 5th, and we left the next morning stopping in Pittsburgh, Columbus, Cheyenne, Salt Lake City, uh, Chicago, a bunch of other places along the way. We took the cars cross country, everybody loved them, especially kids, we got a great reaction to the cars. And it's a fun thing, it's a form of positive activism so that people can see something fun and humorous and you know, point out, we can point out it's a, an issue that matters to everybody and it's been a great experience. I'm very privileged to have been able to go cross country with a bunch of wonderful people. We camped mostly at the campgrounds. We had a couple of um, lovely local activists that hosted us in their homes. Um, for the most part, we were at campgrounds. We actually were eating GMO free as much as we possibly could. So we had a chef on the tour and he made us food from donations of non-GMO food, a lot of organic food that we purchased ourselves and we cooked every night at the campground. Personally, I drove the tomato a little bit. I also drove our, one of our two support vans that came cross country with us to haul gear and food and stuff like that. Um, we had about two or three people for each vehicle um, to drive and kind of rotated to keep everybody fresh and safe on the road. Oh man, actually the rest stops were <laughs> surprisingly a lot of fun. Every time we stopped for gas, everybody at the gas station would be looking around, wondering what's going on, wanting to talk to us, wanting to know what the cars were all about. And we actually did a lot of like face-to-face -face grassroots activism, just stopping to get gas, just talking to people. So that was a, a lot of fun. We had a homestay in Denver that was really great. It was really nice to get to spend a little bit more time there. Um, we had a great event with a local activist group there that m has been meeting every week and working really hard on this issue locally. And it's always great to see that them get all excited as well when we come through and support their efforts that they're already doing. So that was a lot of fun. 
Well, we're all kind of dispersing after um, Hempfest in Seattle. Uh, but a lot of people are flying back to the East Coast to their homes since we're leaving the cars here to support the initiative in Washington State. I personally am going back to my worldwide backpacking tour and flying to Central America. So I'm going to Belize to, to do some scuba diving. Um, then I'll be traveling around Central and South America. Um, I'm on sabbatical right now from my job as a criminal defense attorney. Uh, I was working in Baltimore for the last four years. And right now I'm just traveling around the world and I'm happy to have had an opportunity to give back while I'm doing that. There are 60 some countries worldwide that, 64 countries, thank you, worldwide that require GMO labeling. Um, almost all of Europe, like lots of other places in the world, but unfortunately not in North America. So the United States and Canada are kind of falling behind here in terms of what other countries are doing. Genetically modified food basically means that they're splicing the DNA from these, these crops with things like from other plants and even animals like fish. So it's different from the traditional selective breeding that humanity has done for generations and generations. These things are being made in a lab. They're not anything that would be created by nature. And the problem is that we just don't know all of the long-term impacts of what this is doing to the environment. Um, there's a lot of cross-contamination. Farmers that are trying to grow organic and they don't want GMOs, the pollen is coming in from GMO crops and polluting and contaminating their crops. So this is a real problem. The pesticides are a huge problem where these crops are being made resistant to pesticides like Roundup, which is sold by Monsanto, the company that is probably profiting the most from genetically modified food. And what happens if the farmers are spraying more and more pesticide on these pesticide resistant plants, they're creating pesticide resistant organisms that are going to keep destroying the plants and they're getting more and more pesticides into the food that we're eating. It's virtually impossible to be GMO free in the United States right now um, because our sugar that we're eating comes largely from the sugar beet which is mostly GMO. The corn syrup and other sweeteners that we're eating is coming from corn which is GMO. Even if you're not eating meat that's being fed GMO corn, you're probably eating soy products and 95% of our soy in this country is GMO. So it is difficult to avoid them. Eating whole foods and eating organic foods is really helpful and avoiding processed foods because that's where you're going to get the majority of your GMOs. But there's a lot of good companies that are voluntarily putting a GMO-free label on their products, so you can keep an eye out for that. And again, also buying organic fruits and vegetables and natural whole foods. Absolutely. Vote yes on 522. This is the mandatory labeling initiative here in Washington state. If this gets passed, it'll be a huge step in the right direction for the rest of the country to see that this is an important issue that people do care about it and um, there's nothing wrong with putting a label on the product it just gives consumers more information to make an informed choice you've got a right a right to know a right to know